Okay, hi everyone. This is lecture number two, chemistry. So today we're going to review just the basics of chemistry. Um, how, uh, what is the basic structure of a molecule, um, some basic terminology behind chemistry. Um, we'll do that to lead into a couple of more specifics, so a little bit on acid bases. And then we're really going to get into the biochemistry and the molecules that are used in physiology um, for macromolecules. Okay, so first of all, some of you are sitting there thinking, why do we need to study chemistry in order to understand physiology? Why, Kara, do we have to sit through uh, an hour or two of basic chemistry? Well, basically, this is because chemistry is the basis of how living organisms function and maintain homeostasis until we understand what is going on at the basic chemistry level we can't truly understand um, how the body works and we can't truly treat diseases um, in order to um, change the basic chemistry of what may be going wrong in the body so for example the air we breathe so we breathe oxygen we breathe out carbon dioxide. There's also nitrogen in the air, um, but we don't really use much of that in terms of respiration. The food that we eat, so we're going to talk a little bit about um, large molecules like sugar molecules. There's an example of a sugar molecule, which is in chemical formula C6H12O6. That's one example of a sugar on how our bodies move. When we get into the nervous system, we're going to talk about how electrical gradients help to signal the nervous system to signal the muscles. And that is all related to the electrolytes or the ions in the body, sodium, potassium, calcium, chloride, anything that can carry an electrical charge. And we'll get into what all of that means. So chemistry really seeks to observe and define the particles around us and their properties. So a couple of basic definitions. First, matter. Matter is anything that has mass and occupies space. And what is mass? Mass is the amount of stuff, the amount of particles, the amount of matter in an object. So in other words, when we're asking about mass, we're asking how big something is. How much stuff is in this thing that I am looking at? And then we can talk about the effect of gravity. So on our, um, in our planet, of course, on Earth, we have a certain amount of gravity that pulls down on the matter, and that gives us weight. So in other words, weight and mass are related, but an astronaut always has the same mass, he always has the same number of things um, in his body, the number of particles in his body, but his weight or the effect of gravity on those particles will change if he were to leave the planet and change the gravity around him. So his weight will change in space. So first we're going to talk about atoms. So atoms are the smallest possible, part of, possible particle of any given substance. And atoms are made up of three basic components, a protons, neutrons, and electrons. So let's draw this out for a second. So an atom is going to have in its core protons. Protons have a positive charge. It may also have neutrons. Neutrons have no charge or they are neutral charge. You have a number of protons and neutrons at the core or the center of an atom. Then hovering around the outside of the atom are the electrons. The electrons give an atom its more interesting electrical properties, and they have a negative one charge. So protons have a plus one charge, 
neutrons have no charge and electrons have a negative one charge. So let's look at the atom that I have just drawn for you. This atom has two protons, two neutrons, and one electron. What would you say is the charge of this atom? The charge of this atom would be a plus one charge because you have two positives and one negative. That leaves one positive that is unbalanced. If we were to add a second electron in the outer shell, then the charge would then become neutral because the two electrons are balancing the proton. Okay, so let's continue. So atoms contain protons and neutrons in their core or in the center. Sometimes this is also called the nucleus, but don't confuse this with the nucleus of a cell. Once we get into cells, this is the center of an atom. It will also have electrons moving in, um, moving around in outer shells. So protons and neutrons in the core, electrons moving around on the outside. And here's an example, Adam, um, from your PowerPoint. So there is basically what I've also drawn for you. So there's a couple of protons, a couple of neutrons, and electrons. This particular atom, just like in the example I drew for you, is neutral. Electrons are very dynamic. So electrons are really the interesting part of chemical particles or atoms. They determine the chemical behavior and the bonds that any particular atom can form with other atoms nearby. There's a maximum number of electrons allowed to um, circulate around the shell of an atom. And we have a certain number of shells in which these electrons can hover. So the first shell, or the shell that is closest to the core of an atom, can only hold two electrons. That's the first shell. The next shell can hold up to eight electrons. And we continue to have other shells as the number of protons and electrons increases in an atom. In other words, the more protons you have in the core, the more electrons you can attract in the outer shells, and you will continue to fill up more and more shells depending on the number of protons and electrons in that atom. In this example, for example, we have hydrogen, which has one proton and one electron. Here we have carbon, which has six protons and six electrons. Now in the example of hydrogen, we've only got the first shell with electrons because we only had one. And here in white is showing that we had space for another electron to come around if we needed to make a chemical bond. In the next example, carbon, where we have eight excuse me, six electrons, we have two in the first shell, and then four in the next shell. So for a total of six electrons to balance out the two protons in the core of the carbon, meaning that we have one, two, three, four empty spaces in the very outer shell of carbon with which to make bonds to other atoms. And we could do the same thing for the nitrogen and oxygen examples on this, on this page. Okay. So let's review. An atom is the smallest chemical particle. It's made up of protons and neutrons in the core and electrons in the outer shells. The number of electrons per shell will depend on whether you're in the first shell where you can have two or the outer shells where you can have up to eight and the number of shells will depend on the number of electrons that will be balancing out the protons in the core. Protons are positive charge, and the number of protons, when you look at a periodic table, is called the atomic 
number. So I am linking to this page um, a PDF of a periodic table. Some of you probably haven't looked at a periodic table since high school, um, but let's real quick take a look. I'm going to pull it up. Okay. So here's a periodic table. And what you'll see in the periodic table is that each atom, hydrogen, lithium, beryllium, for example, will have an atomic number. So hydrogen's atomic number is one, lithium's atomic number is three. The atomic number is how many protons are in the core of that atom. And that does not change. If that changes, then you have a new atom. So one proton in the core of a hydrogen atom, three protons in the core of a lithium atom. So if you guys get a chance, print this out, take a look at it, review, try to remember what you learned in your high school, maybe even junior high school chemistry classes. Okay, so back to this. So a proton, the number of protons is called the atomic number, and that will depend on the particular atom you're looking at. A neutron has no charge, but it will add mass or particles to the core. So when you look at your periodic table, look again at the periodic table and you will find that the bottom of each atom, not the atomic number, but the mass number. The mass number is the number of protons and the number of neutrons combining together to add mass or particles to the atom. So sometimes you will not have very many neutrons, sometimes you will have several neutrons, and the mass number will be much bigger than, than the atomic number. So let's look up one another example. Periodic table, here we go, here's lithium. Lithium has an atomic number of three, so how many protons in lithium? Three protons in lithium, and then down here you can see the mass number. Now the atomic mass of lithium is close to seven, 6.9. So that means that lithium, in addition to three protons, also has extra neutrons in its core, adding mass to the total atomic mass number. Now the specific calculations and the specificities of all of that, you guys don't need to know, we're not in a chemistry class. Okay? But that's where the atomic mass number comes from. Okay. So that's protons and neutrons. And then electrons. Electrons have a negative charge, a very tiny mass. They spin around the nucleus in various layers or shells and they are dynamic. They're going to interact with other electrons, they're going to determine the chemical behavior, and their number can change to change the overall charge of an atom. Protons and neutrons, however, will not change. Finally, you guys will hear both atom and elements, such as in periodic table of elements. We don't call it the periodic table of atoms, we call it the periodic table of elements. And elements are basically atoms categorized by the number of protons. So element, atom, basically same thing. Some examples of elements in the human body. There are 25 elements that are essential to life. Oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen are the majority that are needed in the body, and they make up about 96% of the human body. So if we look overall, the majority is oxygen. And that's included when oxygen is part of a larger molecule, for example, water. There are some other elements that are important, so maybe take a look at these in your periodic table. Calcium, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, sodium, chloride, magnesium. These are all elements that you guys will see come up occasionally as we discuss the physiology of the human body.
there's another list of elements common in biology, and here I'm giving you the atomic number and the mass number. Also, very often, because we don't want to write out the whole word, we will just use the symbol of an element. So be familiar with the common symbols for the common elements. Usually it's the first letter of the name of the element, but often it changes. So sodium is probably the most common example of this, where its symbol is Na. Potassium is another common example where its symbol is K. Okay, so now we need to talk a little bit about energy as it relates to electrons. So electrons are interesting, they are dynamic, we've said that already. They have potential energy. In other words, the ability to do work. And they have potential energy that is released or absorbed as they move from shell to shell or move around a nucleus. So as electrons are moving, they can jump from one shell to another. If they leave, then energy will be absorbed. If they come into a shell, then energy will be released. When the number of electrons is the same as the number of protons, the atom is balanced. There is no electrical charge of that atom. But when an atom has more or less electrons than protons, it will have negative or positive charge, forming positive and negative ions. So when you hear the word ion, that is an atom that has a charge. If it's a positive charge, meaning it has more protons, then it's called a cation. If it's a negative charge, meaning it has more electrons than protons, then it's an anion. Another word for ion is electrolyte, because electrolytes are ions that conduct electrical charge. A very common way to signal or communicate within the human body is the movement of ions, and that will then create electrical currents, very, very, very tiny electrical currents that are used by the nervous system and by muscles and other electrical cells to communicate. So some very important ions or electrolytes in the human body that you will see quite often. Sodium and potassium most common. Remember that sodium symbol is Na, and when we put a little plus here, we mean that it has a plus one charge. Potassium symbol is K, and it typically has a plus one charge. And then calcium we will see especially in relation to the heart and skeletal muscles, and calcium has a two plus or a positive two charge. So the basis of electrons moving is the basis of forming and breaking chemical bonds. So losing, gaining, sharing electrons, this is how we make and break chemical bonds. So this is what I say when I say the electrons are the interesting part because this tells us how different atoms may interact. Different chemicals can be formed by bonding different atoms together. There are two main types of bonds. There is a simple ionic bond where we have ions that have a positive or a negative charge and we say opposites attract. So for an ionic bond, Positive ions are attracted to negative ions. This is based simply on charge, and it's a very weak bond between the positive and negative ions. A stronger bond is when atoms actually share electrons, and that's called a covalent bond. Covalent bonds are much stronger, and the electrons will equally hover around the shells of the atoms and make a much stronger bond. So what I like to say is that the ions for ionic bonds, they're just attracted to each other 
the covalent bonds, they're sharing, they're living together. Okay, a little bit of a tighter bond. They're harder to break up. Here's an example of a covalent bond. We have here hydrogen atoms. Hydrogen atom has a proton in its core and then a single electron in its outer shell, meaning there's a space in the outer shell for a second electron to come in. So if another hydrogen is nearby, those electrons find each other's empty spaces in their outer shells and they share, forming a hydrogen gas molecule or an H2 where the two electrons equally hover and are shared around the hydrogen atoms. That is a covalent bond where the two electrons are shared. Here's an example of a sodium ion, a little bit more complicated, but let's look at our shells here. So here is sodium, which has two electrons in its inner shell, eight electrons in one of its outer shells, so two full shells, and then the third shell just has a single electron. That's very unstable. There are a lot of open, empty spaces in the final shell. That electron will be extremely dynamic and will be attracted to a chlorine atom. The chlorine atom has one, two full shells, two electrons, eight electrons, and then the third shell has seven out of eight and one empty space, perfect for that electron from the sodium to then be shared between sodium and chlorine. So that electron will be att attracted to the chlorine atom. They will equally share that electron. No, nope. they won't share. They're going to be attracted, positive and negative. Because of their positive and negative charges, that electron will jump back and forth, and they will form an ionic bond. But it's a simple electron attraction because of the open space in the shell. And that is a very weak ionic bond that forms salt, sodium chloride salt. That can easily then be dissociated in water. Sodium chloride forms crystals that we use as our typical table salt. So here are some other examples of covalent bonds. Hydrogen molecule is the example we gave you where two electrons are shared across two hydrogens. An oxygen gas molecule where electrons are shared across two oxygens. That is a double covalent bond because they're not just sharing two electrons, they're sharing four. And then water. Water has an oxygen and two hydrogens, and they have covalent bonds as two electrons are shared with each of the hydrogens. When an atom loses or gains electrons from its outer shell, it becomes electrically charged. <coughs> that forms an ion. Ions are charged atoms, and ionic bonds will be formed between oppositely charged ions, the cation and the anion, for example, the sodium and the chloride in our example. Covalent bonds will form when outer shell electrons are shared between atoms. Covalent bonds can also be something called polar. We'll talk about polar with respect to water. But if the electrons are not exactly shared equally across the atoms, then they become polar. So in this example for water, and we'll talk about this again in a moment, the oxygen has a tendency to pull the electrons a little more strongly than the hydrogens. So even though the electrons are being fully shared between carbon and hydrogen, Oxygen pulls the electrons more often close to itself, so the oxygen has a slight negative charge, leaving a slight positive charge on the hydrogens, which are drawn in blue here.
Those are polar molecules. So all of this bonding comes together to make molecules. So when atoms are held together by a chemical bond, then they're called a molecule. Molecules are named by the atoms in a bond with a subscript for the number of each atom. So that would be its chemical formula. So for example, C6H12O6, if we look at that, then we know that the subscript tells us there are six carbons, 12 hydrogens, and six oxygens in this bonded molecule. This is a combination very common and seen in many sugars. Okay, back to water. We already started to talk a little bit about how water is polar. Water has many other properties that support life. So water is a molecule that is special and we require water molecules to live. In fact, all living organisms require water molecules to live. In addition, three quarters of the Earth's surface is covered by water. This is to support life on Earth. And two thirds of your body is water. So this is why it's such a big deal when they go to Mars and they find evidence of water on Mars, right? You guys hear stories about um, these, these missions to Mars and they get very excited when they find um, evidence in the past or, or in the history of Mars that there may have been water somewhere because then that gives us an indication that there may be some life, even if it's microscopic bacterial life on Mars. For us on the Earth, three quarters of the Earth's surface is covered by water, and that supports all of the living organisms on Earth. So let's look at the chemical structure of water. So the formula for water is H2O. So that tells us there are two hydrogens and an oxygen. They are bonded. So there's a hydrogen with one electron in its outer shell. There's a hydrogen with one electron in its outer shell. And here's oxygen which has six electrons total, and it will have empty space in its outer shells for two hydrogen. So six electrons in its outer shell, two empty spaces for those hydrogens to come in and bring in their electrons. Then those hydrogens come in and fill up the outer shell of the oxygen and fully share those eight electrons. Water has some very special properties that support life. So here's a list of some of the properties that we are going to go through to show how water is supportive of life. The first two, polarity and hydrogen bonds, inform all of the others. So we'll talk first about its polarity and its hydrogen bonds, and then we'll talk about the rest of the properties of water. Okay, so first, water is polar. So the oxygen atom in a water molecule attracts electrons more strongly than the hydrogen atoms. That means that as the electrons are hovering around and shared between the oxygen and the hydrogens in these bonds, that they tend to hover a little bit more around the oxygen. So oxygen hogs the electrons and gives them a slightly negative charge on the oxygen part of the water molecule. That then means there's a slight positive charge on the hydrogen end of the water molecule. That means that water then will have poles. It has a slightly negative end and a slightly positive end, which makes it polarized or polar. Second, water forms hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen bonds aren't just covalent bonds between hydrogen and oxygen. That's a common mistake. There are covalent bonds between the oxygen and hydrogens in a single water molecule. When we talk about hydrogen bonds, we're talking about these bonds across two water molecules. So it's between the polar ends of multiple water molecules. So it's this drawn in pink here between this water molecule and that water molecule, there is a hydrogen bond connecting this hydrogen to this oxygen across multiple water molecules. So then in a solution, 
or in a mixture of water where you have many water molecules, you will have these hydrogen bonds across multiple water molecules. Hydrogen bonds give a lot of other interesting properties. So one of the properties that hydrogen bonds creates is the way that water forms ice that is less dense than liquid water. Ice, compared to high temperatures, such as what you see in liquid water, the hydrogen bonds are less dynamic and further apart. That changes the structure of how the water molecules interact and makes this solid ice structure that is less dense or more spaced apart than liquid water. Have you ever tried to freeze a full water bottle? If you've ever tried to freeze a full water bottle, you will see that a full water bottle, if you put it in your freezer, will expand and it'll break open the water bottle. So if you're ever gonna freeze a water bottle, you don't wanna fill it all the way up with the liquid. You need to leave some space for the water to expand as the bonds freeze. So what's nice about this is that ice floats. So if you put ice in a cup of water, you will see that the ice floats to the top. So solid ice is less dense than liquid water. And that's handy, say, for supporting life in a lake that freezes over where the ice will be at the top of the lake and the fish can still live underneath through the winter. Another property of water is heat storage. So the hydrogen bonds in the water um, require very high heat to break and that means that water heats up very slowly and holds a very constant temperature. So it doesn't change very easily. Remember back to our homeostasis lecture where we want to resist change. So maintaining a stable internal condition is helped by the amount of water in our body, which can prevent large changes in temperature in the body, despite external changes in the environment. Water also has a high heat of vaporization. So at very high temperatures, hydrogen bonds are very dynamic and they will break, forming water vapor. So many hydrogen bonds have to break in order for water to evaporate and what this does is it releases energy. So this is a reason that sweat cools the body because every gram of water that evaporates from your skin releases just a little bit of heat and cools you down. Another interesting property of water is cohesion. So if you head up to Tahoe or some of these um, other areas in the Sacramento region, um, you will find these little water bugs. And you can see them skating along the surface of water because water has cohesion and surface tension. So hydrogen bonds will hold groups of water molecules together, causing cohesion to itself and this is how we get beading on the window of your car. Beading, for example, here is beading on a spider web because of this cohesion to itself and adhesion to other molecules. So beading of water bubbles creates, uh, because of the surface tension created by the cohesion of water molecules together. There's also something interesting called capillary action where you take a tiny little tube and you put it into a liquid water solution, that water will suck up into that tiny tube just because of the cohesion to itself. This is because of hydrogen bonding, which attracts the water molecules together. Water is also an excellent solvent. So remember back to chemistry, water molecules in a solution will form the maximum amount of hydrogen bonds possible to itself and to other polar molecules. So what this means is that water in the body can facilitate chemical reactions. It can also separate solutions in the body. And we can separate solutions by looking at whether they are attracted to water 
or whether they are repelled by water. So if something is hydrophilic, then it is attracted to water. And this is any molecule that has a charge or a polarity, for example, salts like sodium chloride, will be attracted to water and they will dissolve very easily in water and they can be carried through water solutions in the body. Second and the opposite is what we can use to separate compartments in the body and this is when something is hydrophobic. That is, molecules that have no charge or no polarity do not form hydrogen bonds and will separate from water. So for example, fats and oils, right? We say that oil and water goes together like oil and water. In other words, they disagree. So oil separates from water and that's very handy if you want to separate one solution from another solution. You can put a little barrier of lipid molecules or fat related molecules between the two and then you'll have solution on one side, solution on the other side, and the fat or lipid molecules separating them. So a solution is, if you remember back to chemistry, and I find that my students tend to forget this, so here's a quick reminder. A solution is a liquid consisting of two or more substances that are mixed together. The solvent is the dissolving agent. In our bodies, the solvent is almost always going to be water. So that is what the thing is dissolved in or what the molecules are dissolved in. The solute is the substance that is being dissolved. For example, the sodium chloride. So the solute will be the salt, sodium chloride salt, and the solvent will be the water. And there's your water molecules there. You mix them together, then you have a salt solution. So water being an excellent solvent also has chemical reactivity. And water can be used to make and break bonds in the body. So if you are breaking bonds, we call this hydrolysis. Whenever you see lysis, that means breaking down. So hydrolysis, hydrolysis, is when you use water to break bonds apart. So you have a large molecule, you put a water between the bonds of a molecule, and then you can break that molecule into parts by separating with water. That's hydrolysis. We also have dehydration reactions, and those are reactions in which we remove water. So you have water components in order to form bonds. So components of hydrogen and a OH, or hydroxide, we remove those pieces of the molecules and form a bond where they once were, and that gives off water as a byproduct, and that's a dehydration reaction where we removed water to form bonds between two molecules. So water has chemical reactivity that helps the body make and break molecules. Ionization. So the covalent bonds in the water can break, the covalent bonds between the hydrogen and the oxygen. And if they do that, it's called ionization of water. So water can separate into a hydrogen and a hydroxide ion. A hydrogen ion, when it has separated from the water molecule as a whole, will have a plus one charge. A hydroxide ion, when it has separated from the hydrogen, has a negative one charge. This doesn't happen very often, but when we add other molecules to water, it's more common, and this is a general principle of acid-base chemistry. So now we can move on to acid-base chemistry. So for acid-base chemistry, guys, we're going to do this very, very, very um, superficial level. So if any of you are chemists, I know you guys are going to start rolling over, um, but we're going to do this very simply, just what we need to study for physiology. So an acid is any substance that will dissociate in water to make more H plus or hydrogen ions. 
A base is any substance that combines with hydrogen when it's dissolved in water. And then if we look here, we have an acid and a base in its most simple form. So a hydrogen ion will be the simplest form of an acid, and it's an H+, plus, carries a plus 1 charge. A hydroxide ion, or an OH-, minus, will be the simplest form of a base, and it will have a negative 1 charge. When you have more hydrogen ions liberated in solution, then you have more acid. When you have fewer hydrogen ions in solution, or you have more hydroxide or more bases to soak up the hydrogen ions, then you have low acid or more alkaline, more basic. So an acid is a chemical compound that basically donates hydrogen ions to solution. So here's another example of an acid, hydrogen chloride. When that is added to water, it liberates a lot of hydrogen ion and we then have a high acid content of that solution. A base is a compound that will soak up hydrogen ions. So one example is sodium hydroxide. When we add that to water, the OH- minus will soak up the H plus ions from the water and will create a basic or alkaline solution. So acids have higher hydrogen. Bases have something that will soak up those hydrogens and remove them from solution. In chemistry and in biology, we use the pH scale to represent the concentration of acid. And what I want you guys to remember from chemistry is that it is low when acid is high. So if you look at the equation, and I want you guys to memorize this equation, the pH is equal to the negative log base of the hydrogen ion concentration. So in other words, this negative sign means that it's a negative relationship. When the hydrogen ions go up, Right? When the acid increases, the pH will go down. So a very low pH means you have high levels of acid or high levels of hydrogen ion. So it's a log-base relationship, so each change in pH represents a tenfold, a very large change in acid concentration. And if we look at some just basic values of pH in the body, then we go from zero, the most acidic possible, to 14, or the most basic possible. And then in the middle will be seven, which is neutral. So generally, pH seven is neutral. A pH higher than seven is basic, meaning you will have low hydrogen ion concentration. A pH lower than 7 is going to be acidic because of that negative relationship. Look back to that equation. And that means you have a lot of hydrogen ion in, in solution. So some examples of pH in the body. Okay. Water is going to be neutral. It's going to have a pH of 7. Blood is going to be neutral. It's going to be around 7. Yeah, okay, closer to 7.4, but who's counting? Blood pH is going to be neutral. Why? Because we're trying to maintain homeostasis and maintaining neutral body. Saliva has a pH of 6, just a little bit acidic. Stomach acid has a pH of 2, high acid. Some other examples of some common things you may see around your house or just every day. So the pH in most living cells is around 7.4, and you would survive only a few minutes if your blood pH fell below 7 or above 7.8. What does that sound like? Right? It sounds like a homeostatic set point. So pH should be 7.4. You have a range of 7 to 7.8. Okay. So what we want in the body is to minimize changes in pH by preventing free hydrogen ions. 
and hydroxide ions from forming. So cells will contain buffers in the form of various enzyme and chemical reactions that will protect against pH changes. So remember, pH is one of the main factors controlled by homeostasis. Your body actually has acid sensors that will trigger reactions if the blood pH is too low to make sure that we are maintaining homeostasis in body pH. Okay, chemical reactions. So that's enough on acid base to move on to chemical reactions. So chemical reaction is the making or breaking of chemical bonds to change, form, or break apart molecules. And basically we write chemical reactions like this. Reactant or multiple reactants combining together to form a product. This is a chemical equation where we say reactant 1 plus reactant 2 goes to product or sometimes multiple products. They are also reversible. Given a lot of product, the product can be broken down into its initial reactants. So atoms will combine together to make molecules. We can describe those combinations in chemical equations. Molecules are formed by living organisms that contain carbon and are called organic molecules. Okay, so this is a good time to take a coffee break if you guys need a coffee break. We're going to now move on to large molecules or organic molecules or macro molecules. So molecules are formed by living organisms. They contain carbon. So when you hear the word organic in biology, it's not like organic that you see at the grocery store. So it's not meaning pesticide free is usually what we mean when we say organic at the grocery store. When we say organic in chemistry or in biology, we mean it has carbon. The body has thousands of different organic molecules, each with a special function. So now we're going to move on to talking about organic molecules and some of the large organic molecules that are in the body. There are four basic categories. There are proteins, nucleic acids, which includes DNA and RNA, carbohydrates, which are sugars, and lipids, which are fats and oils. Now, these are molecules that are important in our everyday lives, and that's one of the reasons we track them on our nutrition labels. So macromolecules are important for everyday functions, which is why they are considered nutrition. Fats and cholesterol are part of the lipid category. We track fats and cholesterols on our nutrition labels. Starch and sugars are carbohydrates. And proteins, we don't have a special name for them. Proteins are just proteins. So what I want you guys to track, and maybe in a separate sheet of paper, is to track both the large molecules, but also what combinations of other molecules are used to make up those macromolecules. So macromolecules are large molecules, and the four basic combinations are this. Amino acids make proteins. Nucleotides make nucleic acids. Monosaccharides group together into disaccharides and polysaccharides into carbohydrates, and lipids are made up basically of fatty acids and various other combinations of triglycerides. So there are small, small molecules which are combined to make macro or larger molecules. So the body can build up and break down these macromolecules depending on its needs. And when we get to the digestive system, we'll talk a little bit more about breaking down these molecules with enzymes. But we will also talk about the synthesis or the formation of certain molecules. The single building block or of a small molecule is a monomer. We link these monomers together to form a macro molecule, or in other words, a polymer. So mono means one. So one single unit is a monomer. Poly is many. Many units together will make these larger molecules and make polymers. So here are macro molecules broken down into their monomers. So proteins are made up of chains of amino acids. Nucleic acid 
like DNA, are made up of chains of nucleotides. Carbohydrates, or starches, are made up of chains of monosaccharides. Lipids a bit more complicated, but just for consistency we'll say lipids are made up of chains of fatty acids. Okay, so let's start with proteins. Proteins are made up of amino acids. There are 20 different kinds of amino acids possible in biochemistry. And amino acids are held together by peptide bonds. We have many, many amino acids that can make up a single protein. The combination of amino acids will be unique to each protein and cr can create a wide range of functional and physical properties. So I think of amino acids like Legos. You can have red, you can have green, you can have blue, you can have yellow, and you can string them together in many different ways to get very complicated three-dimensional proteins. So you could have a protein that's made up of just one out of 20 types of amino acids, and we'll just have a very long string of, say, all red Legos, but you could make a very complicated protein based on just that single amino acid. Each amino acid has its own properties that will create the properties of the protein. So the shape of the protein, as we put these amino acid Legos together, is very important for its function. And we call this protein folding. So protein folding will occur based on the bonding of amino acids together and the interaction of the protein with the solution around it. There's four levels of structure possible for any given protein. Folding, primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. And this is basically first, second, three-dimensional, and then more complex interaction of the three-dimensional quaternary. So the primary structure of a protein is the simple linear order of amino acids. So the amino acids will be bonded together by peptide bonds, and this will be the linear amino acids in a string. So many, many amino acids here. Each circle is representing an amino acid, and here we have two types of amino acids, blue and pink all bonded together in a linear string by peptide bonds. That's a primary structure. The amino acids then based on their chemical structure will start to fold. Sometimes they will fold in sheets, which we call beta sheets. Sometimes they will twist in helixes. Here's an alpha helix. Sometimes they will make other more complex coiled shapes, where you'll have partially sheets, partially coils. These are secondary structures to a protein. It's when the protein begins to fold a bit or form a helix. Then we have three-dimensional and more complex levels that can form pockets, large sites of interaction or binding sites, and different combinations of shapes. So here, for example, is a three-dimensional tertiary structure where you've got some helices, some sheets, some different coils, and you'll put all of those together to make a three-dimensional or a tertiary structure of a molecule. You can then take multiple tertiary structures and build them onto each other to make a quaternary structure. So here, for example, here's a tertiary structure. This is the pink portion of this quaternary structure. And you put multiple pieces or subunits together and you get a four dimension, four, uh, fourth stage of folding, which is quaternary structure. These shapes are extremely important to weigh that proteins function. And a protein can be damaged if its folding is lost. It can be damaged by low pH or high acid. It can be damaged by high temperature. And if it does that, it can lose its folding and it will become what we call denatured. So denaturing a protein causes it to lose its shape and its function. My best example of this is um, 
people who have curly hair who try to straighten or perm their hair. So you have curly hair, you can add a bunch of heat using uh, hair dryers and, and flat irons, you can add a bunch of heat to it and it'll go from curly to straight, right? That is denaturing or losing the folding of the proteins that are in the hair. You can also add chemical straighteners, which can flatten out and cause the, the proteins in your hair to straighten out. But you can also burn your hair. So usually when you add heat or chemicals to your hair, it's, it's temporary. And that can cause it to become straighter, but as soon as you wash it, it will refold and go back to its original shape. Okay. That's sort of an early change in folding, but it hasn't yet lost its function. If you denature it to the point of burning it or frying it, think of if you ever fried your hair, okay, then you can cause it to completely lose shape and function permanently, and that's denaturing. So you can completely lose the folding of a protein, completely denature, and it will be unable to interact with what it needs to interact with. And what is it interacting with? Well, proteins have many functions in the body. They form structure of the body. They help with chemical reactions, enzymes. They move things in the body so they can be transport proteins, creating little vessels for movement. They can uh, be important for defense, like immune defense, for um, attacking bacteria and other things, and they can actually move cells and parts of cells. They can contract and shorten our muscles or shorten parts of cells, contractile proteins. We could go on and on about proteins, but as we go through this class, we will have examples of each of these in the body. Here are just some examples for you. So structural proteins are very strong and fibrous proteins. A lot of, a lot of um, tight fibers um, created by these proteins. One example is collagen. Collagen um, can create some of the larger supportive proteins that are found in connective tissues throughout the body. Another example is um, keratin, which is found in hair. And then contractile proteins, which are found in muscles, those are myosin and actin that can move our muscles. They have a very important role in structure, and they're basically construction materials for the tissues in the body. We can also have globular proteins, which will have complex folded structures. So an example of a complex folded protein in the body is hemoglobin. Um, hemoglobin can carry oxygen in our cells, and it will actually change shape based on its environment to drop off or release oxygen where it's needed in the body. They play a very bright, vital role in cell function because of their ability to change shape and they can act as transport proteins in the example of hemoglobin transporting oxygen. They can act as hormones, receptors, enzymes, you name it, these proteins can do it. Now I've said enzymes several times but we have not discussed really what an enzyme is. So an enzyme is a protein that can assist in chemical reactions. In other words, they increase the speed of chemical reactions. They have a three-dimensional shape, and that three-dimensional shape includes an active binding site that fits another molecule very specifically. So an enzyme will grab one reactant, grab another reactant, put them together for help to form a product. It can also grab products, break it apart, help to form reactants. It's going to increase the speed of chemical reactions by increasing the probability that molecules will come together. So it will bind a specific molecule at its binding site, and it can hold or stretch molecules in place to increase the speed of those chemical reactions. So here is an enzyme, which is three-dimensional shape. See all these circles are each of the, the amino acids. There are many different types. They're all one color here just for simplicity's sake. And here's a little piece here where it opens up 
to make room for a molecule to come in. That is the active site of the enzyme where the molecule of a particular chemical reaction will come in and be held onto by the enzyme. So for enzymes, the example that I like to give are kindergartners in the playground um, or maybe uh, your kids at the park, right? So if you uh, ask them to do something like, hey guys, let's all line up in front of the door, then they may be all over the place, right? Okay. Well, what the enzyme will do is grab one, grab the other, put them together closer. Okay. So they're not all over the place. It'll bring them closer together. They'll be more likely to react. So it's not that the reaction couldn't take place before, it's just that the enzyme with its active binding site can hold on to molecules, bring them closer together, and make the interaction more likely to happen. So that's an enzyme. Those were all examples of proteins and some specifics on proteins. So our next category of macromolecules is nucleotides, which build up to make nucleic acids. So nucleic acids being DNA and RNA. So the category here would be DNA, RNA, nucleic acids, and their building blocks are the nucleotides. Now I put these together intentionally to remind you guys how similar these words are, and this happens quite often on exams where students mix up nucleotides with nucleic acids. So the nucleotides are the building blocks of the nucleic acids. But they are complex molecules in and of themselves. And they are made up of three parts. A five carbon sugar, diagrammed here in blue. A phosphate, diagrammed here in yellow. And then a nitrogen containing base, diagrammed here in pink. And there's another type here in pink. And we link these nucleotides together with their three groups to the next nucleotide, there's another one, to make nucleic acids. So some nucleotides are used to transfer and store energy, or they're used in chemical signaling. For, for example, we'll talk a lot about ATP. ATP has three phosphate groups, not just one. Its sugar is ribose and its base or nu nucleotide base is adenine. So this together makes adenosine triphosphate, ATP. ATP can be used for cellular work. We have some other nucleotides, NAD, FAD, GTP, AMP, ADP. You guys will hear all of these when we discuss energy in the upcoming lectures. Mainly though, we talk about the nucleotides that are built up into nucleic acids for DNA and RNA. So nucleotides are the monomers of DNA and RNA. Phosphate group, sugar, and a nitrogenous base. So they are information storage molecules. In other words, they provide directions for the building of proteins, and we're going to spend an entire lecture on how proteins are synthesized or made. So you'll refer back to this a bit and we'll give even more details on the process of making proteins where we start with nucleic acids, DNA and RNA, DNA first transcribes to mRNA and those codes are then read to make a final protein, doing all of those protein functions that we just talked about. There are two types of nucleic acids, DNA and RNA. So first, the nucleotides in DNA and RNA. So the nucleotides in DNA and RNA are named based on the nitrogenous base. So in other words, the phosphate and the sugar groups are constant, but the bases change. And there are five possible bases for DNA or RNA. A, G, T, C, and U. And the long words for these, adenosine, guanine, cytosine, thymine, and uracil. These nucleotides, which are the building blocks of DNA and RNA, act like letters in a genetic alphabet. 
combination of three nucleotides is a genetic code for one amino acid. We will have long strings of nucleotides then that will hold the code for a large protein or many strings of amino acids together. So nucleotides are like letters in an alphabet in a library. So when a cell wants to make a protein, goes to the DNA library, and it looks up the code for that protein. In other words, it reads the nucleotides on DNA. RNA will then translate those nucleotides by opening up the DNA and reading it. It will then take the code out to the cell and use the RNA nucleotides, which is now the new code, to make a specific protein. I know this all sounds like Greek to you guys. It'll make more sense when we do our DNA and RNA lecture for protein synthesis, okay? So DNA is a five carbon sugar, has a five carbon sugar called deoxyribose. That's where the D for DNA comes from. Then the possible nitrogenous bases are A, G, T, and C. Which one's missing? The U. So T is only in DNA, showing the second U is only in RNA. DNA structure is a long, double-stranded, wrapped in a double helix. Here's DNA. You guys have seen these diagrams, I'm sure, all over the place. So DNA carries actually two copies, one on each side of the helix of the genetic code which is in nucleotides. There's an A, C, T, G. They're all strung together along a strand of DNA. And then there's a mirror image of that copy. We'll talk about more when we get into the DNA lecture to make the other side of that helix. So it carries two copies of the entire genetic code stabilized and wrapped together in a double helix. The nucleotides of the two strands in the double helix are joined by hydrogen bonds where A always bonds to T and G always bonds to C. Then RNA. The five carbon sugar in RNA is ribose and that is where the R for RNA comes from, ribonucleic acid. The possible nitrogenous bases in RNA are A, U, G, and C. So there's no T in RNA, just U. RNA structure is a long single strand. So here's RNA. So there's the U, A, C, G, A, U, G. So here's our nucleotides, and they're strung together. So there's the sugar, there's the phosphate, there's the base, strung together in a linear strand. The function of RNA is to read the DNA and encode a single amino acid sequence for a protein that will be made by the cell. So RNA goes to that more complex double helix DNA and it pulls out what it needs and takes that message out to the cell to make a protein. Next category of macromolecules is carbohydrates. Carbohydrates store energy and provide structural support for cells. We're gonna have a lecture on energy and metabolism and I'll show you guys how they store energy. Carbohydrate is made up of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio. So we already gave the example of C6H12O6, where that's 1 to 2 to 1 ratio of carbons to hydrogen to oxygen. Simple carbohydrates are the smallest possible sugars, and they have monosaccharides. They only have a single carbon ring, and you'll see sugars drawn as rings here, where at each of these, we don't draw the C's or we don't write in the C's, these are shorthand, each of these bonds is a carbon. And that makes a ring. This ring together makes up glucose. That is a monosaccharide, it has a single ring. Here's fructose, there's another single ring, another monosaccharide. Disaccharides will have two rings stuck together. So if glucose and fructose combine and we get a bond between glucose and fructose, then we get sucrose, which has two rings. 
Simple carbohydrates are the immediate energy sources for cells in the body. So both monosaccharides and disaccharides um, are very easy energy sources for the body. We can put multiple sugar rings together, not just to make a disaccharide, but to make polysaccharides. Polysaccharides have many functions in biology. In our bodies, they are storage of energy. So starch and glycogen are used for energy storage and they can be broken down into their individual monosaccharides for energy. Okay, the last category is lipids. So fats and other bio biological molecules that are not soluble in water are called lipids. Lipids are waxy, greasy, oily substances that separate from water. They are hydrophobic, and because they do that, they can form barriers, separating compartments in the body. They also carry a lot of carbon bonds that can be used to store energy. So some examples of lipids in the body are fats, phospholipids, iconosoids, cholesterol, and steroid hormones. Lipids have hydrophobic properties that are very important when we get into their function in cells. So here's the example of a cell membrane, and we're going to talk a lot about the properties of these particular lipids, these ones that are drawn in white here, phospholipids. So like other lipids, they are not soluble in water and they will separate in solution. This is because they cannot form hydrogen bonds and they are hydrophobic. So you'll have a solution here, which is a water solution, a solution here, which is a water solution. You put lipids in between and the lipids will separate from the solution. That's handy for making compartments like the outside of a cell to the inside of a cell. So phospholipids will talk a lot about separating compartments in and around cells. Other fats, other lipids used in the body are fats. So fats are made up of fatty acids and glycerol. They are used for long-term energy storage in the body. They can be broken down into a lot of energy. They are also used for their cushioning and insulating properties. So fatty acids can be categorized as saturated, meaning that their tails all line up. That's what you might see, for example, in butter, where it's very solid. Or they can be unsaturated, where the tails don't line up. And that is what you will see in less solid lipids, less solid fats, such as oils. Those are unsaturated. So unsaturated fatty acids have less than the maximum number of hydrogens bonded to the carbons, and they're more dynamic, meaning they're liquid at room temperature. Oh, some examples would be most plant oils, vegetable or corn oils. Saturated fatty acids have the maximum number of hydrogens bonded to the carbons, and they are more solid, and they're harder to break down. This is most animal fats. Phospholipids form cell membranes. They also form protective sheets around nerve cells or neurons, and they are made up of a phosphate head. Here's the phosphate group here, which is hydrophilic, and lipid tails, which make these long hydrophobic regions. And we'll talk more about that when we get to membranes in the cell lecture. Icosanoids are carbon, excuse me, are lipids that are made up of 20 carbon fatty acids, and they are actually used as small signaling molecules. So they, they can be chemical signals, they can regulate various physiological functions. Some examples, the most common you'll see are prostaglandins, which can be chemical signaling molecules, leukotrienes, thromboxanes. These will be seen throughout the body where they can move in and out of cells very easily and signal. Steroids and cholesterol will come up a bit as well. Cholesterol is the basis from which all other steroids are made. 
So I know cholesterol gets a lot of bad press, but it's actually a very important component of cells where it stabilizes cell membranes, and I'll show you that when we talk about cells. And it is also the basis for synthesizing other steroid hormones. So for example, steroid hormones being testosterone, estrogen, cortisol, other steroids, bile salts, have digestive function. So let's finish up with this. Why are we learning all of this again? Here's an example of respiratory physiology where we'd be using everything that we just learned for chemical reactions in physiology. So here's the example. Carbon dioxide is produced in body cells as they undergo metabolism to break down glucose, a sugar, in order to make energy. When carbon dioxide combines with water molecules in the blood, this chemical reaction takes place. Water plus carbon dioxide, which ultimately liberates acid, hydrogen ion, and bicarbonate. In other words, as you accumulate carbon dioxide in the blood, it will react with water and release acid. Long-term breath holding, or hypoxia, can cause acid levels, which will trigger pH sensors to force you to breathe out and remove excess carbon dioxide. Because homeostatically, excess acid is not good for the enzymes and other chemicals in the body. So when you breathe out carbon dioxide, you are actually getting rid of